Let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. Dear God in heaven, indeed, we are truly grateful to You for the mercy that You have poured out on us in Jesus Christ. That He indeed is the Savior from sin. That through Him, Your people have been redeemed. Through Him, we will stand in Your immediate presence. Having been forgiven and cleansed from all our sin. Not because of what we have done, but because of Him and what He has done on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We pray that you would bless us this morning and enrich us with the truth concerning Christ and the fact that he is indeed the Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. To begin with this morning, I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at several verses this morning. And one of the themes, the primary theme that we are examining this morning is the fact that Jesus Christ is the Savior from sin. Oftentimes today, Individuals come to Christmas and they approach Christ merely as an infant in a manger and they identify with the humility of Christ merely to the extent that they acknowledge that such a condition as an infant being born in a stable and then laid down and kept in a manger is not an ideal situation. And they identify with the poorness of Christ on that level. And indeed, certainly he had humbled himself. And the Bible is explicitly clear about that. That him coming as God in the flesh to that manger was an aspect of humility. Ultimately, that humility was demonstrated in his death on the cross, according to Philippians. But I want us to look specifically this morning at the various verses, or some of the various verses, that speak specifically at the beginning of the coming of our Lord to the fact that he had come as a Savior from sins. Now, keep in mind that from this time that Matthew records concerning the birth of Christ to the very first prophecy of the coming of Christ, if we were to go back and to examine that this morning, I'll give you the reference. It's in Genesis 3.15, spoken after sin had entered the world. If we were to go back in time to that text, we would go back almost 4,000 years from this point of Matthew. From our time, approximately 6,000 years or so. Now, I know that we live in a world today, a day and an age where evolutionists, and sadly, because they have infiltrated evangelicalism. There are many who name the name of Christ that also hold to the doctrines of evolutionary theory. They hold to doctrines of uniformitarianism that the Bible speaks of in Second Peter chapter 3. Everything just keeps on going as it always has and no difference. But the world isn't that old. 
And the time from when sin entered the world to the birth of Christ wasn't that long. Yes, it was spread over many generations. But relatively speaking, not a long time. Not a long time. And it's only been a little over 2,000 years to our time since Christ came the first time into the world. And if 4,000 years in respect to the age of the earth is not a long time, then half that couldn't even be considered much time at all. But in that time, from the first sin and first prophecy of Christ's coming, God began to give the world in particular Israel, a multitude of prophecies concerning Christ and His coming. As a matter of fact, between the book of Genesis and the book of Malachi, the last book of the 39 books of the Old Testament, there are some 300 prophecies that were given in the Old Testament that relate specifically to the events surrounding the first coming of Christ. Over 300 prophecies that deal with his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. And during that time, the people of God that were living by faith were looking for him. And they were looking for him, not just staring off into space someplace, they were looking for him in the light of those words that God had given them concerning His first advent. And that's why here in Matthew, as we saw last week, what you see multiple times and in other texts, statements to the effect that this came to pass to fulfill that which was spoken by the prophet. And so what Matthew does here is he reaches back and he pulls out those prophecies, and he matches them to the events with Christ's birth. But keep in mind that his coming was expected. And there were people over multiple generations that were reading the Word of God and looking for him, waiting for him. And we come to this text. I'll ask you to move down to verse 21. Matthew 1, 21. They were looking for a Savior. They were looking for a Savior, as we will see this morning, from their enemies. And at the same time, they were also looking for a Savior from their sin. Now, the Bible in the Old Testament, whenever it gave the prophecies of the coming of Christ, it often combined both the first coming and the second coming together. And so you could see why as you go back, and we won't this morning, but as you go back and you look at the combinations of those prophecies, the first advent of Christ, the second advent of Christ, you can see why it was easy for them to focus on His second coming and the events of it. Deliverance in particular from their enemies. And sadly, because of their own confusion at times that we all experience, they looked over the importance of the first aspect of His coming and that for sins. Not all of them. But the Bible didn't confuse that. And it was specific that Christ in His first advent would come for sins. Take a look at 121. Regarding the message of the angel to Joseph as he speaks about Mary, he says to Joseph, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. The name Jesus in the Greek means salvation, 
is from the Lord, or the Lord saves. And then he gives an explanation as to why he will be called Jesus. The text says, for, so you're going to call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from their sins. Turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Luke. And there to Luke chapter 1. Now whenever you turn to Luke chapter 1, and to this particular verse, Luke 1 and 47, you are turning to Mary's exclamation as she has visited Elizabeth. Now the angel Gabriel has already appeared to Mary. And he's told Mary in the previous verses that she would be with child of the Holy Spirit. And the last thing that Gabriel told Mary was that her cousin Elizabeth was with child, John the Baptist. And so Mary naturally goes to visit her. And Mary, upon visiting her, makes this statement. In verse 47, And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Again, a reference to God as her Savior. Here in Luke 1, move down with me to Zacharias' prophecy as he speaks about John the Baptist here. Now notice what Zechariah says with regard to salvation. Take a look at verse 70. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father to grant us that we be rescued, that we being rescued from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. But notice what else he said. Notice as the text goes on. In holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, he's talking here about John the Baptist, his own son, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. So John, as he's speaking here, these prophetic words and communicating them to his son, John the Baptist, speaks of the fact that John would be the forerunner of Christ, prophesied in the book of Malachi, and he would prepare the way for the Lord, not that he, John, would save the people from their sins, but that Christ would, and that he would bring the knowledge that is John of salvation and prepare them to receive the salvation that comes from Christ. Salvation in particular from their sins. From their sins. Luke 2.11 Turn there in your Bibles with me. We read this a little earlier. The angels are appearing to the shepherds, and they proclaim to the shepherds, For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. While you're here in Luke 2, move down to verse 29. 
Then you'll remember this is the case of Jesus eight days after his birth being brought to the temple and there to be circumcised. And Simeon, who is tending the temple there, comes and he takes Christ in his arms in verse 28. And verse 29, the text says, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Now I'm going to ask you to move over to another text farther on in the New Testament to the book of Galatians, chapter 2, or chapter 4 actually. Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born under Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Verse 5. So that He might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. All of these verses proclaim Christ as the Savior. And very specifically, they point to the fact that humanity needs a Savior from their sins. From their sins. Now, whenever places like Hollywood get a hold of this message, because they have no soundness in their theology, they turn the sins into a little different thing, and they begin to focus on something else. They may focus on the evidence of sin, they may focus on the consequence of sin, but they do not address the reality of sin in the proper context. And sadly, many today are influenced by that kind of theology, if you can even call it theology. And the devil is very content with that because it's enough to cause people to miss the mark. It's enough to cause people to receive the Word initially with gladness, but whenever trials come because of the world, they quickly fall away. In other words, it can move them to become religious whenever you're not addressing sin in the proper way, and it can cause them to get caught up in religious things and be very faithful to it until... Well, the things they came for are just as problematic, if not more, than before they came. For instance, many today look at sin and define it as a broken home, a fatherless household, or a motherless household. Or they define it as an inability to achieve the wealth that is desired by someone. Or they define sin as just problems in the world, such as war. And certainly certain wars are sin. And certainly some of these things, broken homes and other things, have come as a result of sin. But sin is much more than those things. And it's vital that it's properly defined. Because it is from those sins that Christ came to save His people. And we need to define sin just like we define the Savior, in the light of revelation of Scripture, not in the hopes and desires of people, Right or wrong, though they may be, they must, Christ must be defined in the light of His Word. 
just like sin must be defined in the light of God's Word. The Bible tells us twice in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, that there is a way that seems right to man, but the end of the way thereof is death. In Hebrews chapter 3, one of the dimensions of sin is that it is deceitful. It makes you believe something that is contrary to truth. So it's vital that we come to Scripture to define sin and to understand what the Bible is communicating to us whenever it says that Christ came as the Savior. So let me give you, in summation, and I praise the Lord for the simpleness of the definition that God gives concerning sin. In the Old Testament, David, whenever he confessed his sin to God, he used three words to sum it up. Three words. He used the word transgressions, he used the word iniquity, and he used the word sin. And you can find those three words mentioned specifically by David as he spoke of his sin in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Three words, transgressions, iniquity, and sin. Now, whenever David used those words, he didn't use them capriciously, nor did he use them indiscriminately. He actually took the very words of God that God used to define sin. God said in Exodus 34, verse 7, Who keeps loving kindness for thousands, describing himself? Who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin? Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. So David, he didn't just pull those words out of the air. He quoted God and God's words concerning sin. The word in the Hebrew that translates our word sin is a root word that has the meaning for missing the mark or missing the target or to go astray. The book of Judges actually uses this word to describe the skill of some 700 left-handed men who could sling a stone at a hair and not miss in Judges 20:16 and not miss. The word translated miss there is the same Hebrew word used to translate the, or the same Hebrew word translated, sin. In the moral sense, sin is the fact of not measuring up or to or missing the mark of God's holiness. So whenever we're talking about sin, it's talking about, the Bible is talking about coming short of the glory of God in respect to His holiness. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us explicitly in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So whenever we're talking about sin, it's talking about first and foremost, not measuring up to God and to His standard of holiness. So whenever the Bible says that Jesus came to save from sins, the very first thing that we need to understand is that everyone He saves, those are those who did not measure up to God's holiness. He came to save those who fell short. 
Next, transgression. Transgression means to go beyond the law or command of God, to violate his command. Even Job himself, who lived prior to the commandments, understood that he had committed transgressions in Job 7.21 and 14.17. The Bible tells us also in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, that Eve transgressed. Transgressions not to be taken lightly. For the Bible actually explains transgression as rebellion against God. Listen to Exodus with me, 23, 21. Be on your guard before Him and obey His voice. Do not be rebellious toward Him, for He will not pardon your transgression, since My name is in Him. So transgression then is not merely going beyond the command of God, but a defiance of God Himself. So whenever we're talking about sin, it is to be understood as coming short of His holiness, transgressing His law, defying what He said, and going on beyond it. So whenever the Bible speaks of Christ coming as the Savior from sins, it's talking about the fact that this infant, who would eventually grow up, has come to save those who have fallen short of the glory of God, those therefore who are unholy, those who have rebelled against Him. And finally, that third word, iniquity. Iniquity. The word iniquity comes from a Hebrew word that means twisted or perverted. It refers to a life or act that is twisted or perverted from that which God has said is right. Specifically, iniquity speaks to the character of sin and the guilt it produces. So, Sin is a falling short of the glory of God. A rebellion against His command. And such action and such condition is a perversion of God's design. Now we live in a world today where no one likes to hear those kinds of things. Especially, believe it or not, at Christmas. No one wants to hear this baby has come to save you perverted, unholy, rebellious people. But in reality, isn't that the message that the angels are proclaiming? That He has come to save you from your sins. We need a Savior from our sins. Now the violation of God's commands expresses sin's presence. Specifically, the sinfulness of one's own heart. Of one's own heart. Not merely actions and the fact that the sinner by nature does not measure up to God's standard. Those are all true. In effect, the sinner misses the mark of God's holiness by his deeds because he has already missed it by his nature. According to Scripture, a person does not become a sinner by sinning. Why does the bird fly? He flies because he's a bird. Why does the fish generally swim in the water? Because He's a fish. Why do people sin? Because by nature, they are sinners. 
sinful actions necessitate and reveal the reality of a sinful heart, a sinful nature, a condition that exists, a cause that is there. And apart from a divine work of God, fallen man is not and cannot do otherwise but sin. He must have a Savior from sin. He must. And God sent the Savior in Jesus Christ. One other point, and we've really made it for the most part with regard to the word transgression, transgression but I want to hit on it directly. All that sin consists of has one objective in character, in nature, and in deed. It is to assault God and His holiness. David knew that. That's why whenever he confessed his sin, and he spoke of his sin being with him from conception. So he captured not only the actions of his sins, but he captured the cause whenever he said that he was conceived in iniquity. But he also went on to say something else. He said, against you as he spoke to God, and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Psalm 51, verse 4. Sin's a nature issue. And it is a nature that is first and foremost against God. The Bible in the book of Romans communicates that clearly. Romans chapter 8 tells us that those who are in the flesh are enmity against God. They're enmity against Him. So whenever we consider Christ, the babe, there in the manger, we must do so in the light of Scripture that tells us He has come to save His people from their sins from the character of them having fallen short of the glory of God, for the, the transgression, the going beyond, the rebellion against God's law, and the perverted nature of doing so. The message of Scripture is that Christ as the Savior is God saving His people. We know that clearly. Now, John, as he wrote his gospel, didn't address specifically the infancy of Christ, but he did acknowledge his humanity as well as his deity. He opened his book, as you are familiar, in the beginning was the Word, John 1.1. 1, 1. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then a few verses later, in verse 14, he wrote, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Bible tells us clearly that Christ coming as the Savior of the world is God in the flesh. Remember Matthew 1.23. And behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. This is consistent with the Old Testament. In multiple places, in particular in Isaiah 45, 21, God says, And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. John the Baptist, at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, 
So at the beginning of his birth, whenever you see him born, he's referred to as the Savior. At the beginning of his ministry, the Bible tells us that John introduced Jesus by saying in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus himself described his death as a payment for sin. When in the upper room, he instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, 28, the text says, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, Paul wrote and said, Christ died for sins. John again wrote in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 5, of Christ, he said, he has released us from our sin by his blood. And whenever he used the word blood there, he's referring very specifically to Christ's death because the Bible in the Old Testament established the fact that life was in the blood. And so whenever the blood was spilled, the life was lost. So whenever we come to Christ's words there in Matthew 26, 28, concerning the Lord's Supper, and John's word there in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, concerning the blood of Christ, instrumental in releasing us from our sins, they are both speaking about His death. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 John, chapter 2 and chapter 4, that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. For our sins. The idea behind that is that Christ took on Himself the sins of those for whom He died. God in the Old Testament said that He would lay the iniquity, the sin, and the transgression of His people on Christ in the book of Isaiah. And that's exactly what transpired on the cross. And Christ willfully took that sin and He bore it on behalf of His people. Not some of it. Not most of it. But all of it. All of it. He is the Savior. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God who came into the earth to save His people from their sins. From the fact that they had come short of the glory of God's holiness. From the fact that they were rebellious against Him from the fact that they were perverted and unholy, twisted in their natures and bent on assaulting God. You know, whenever you start looking at Christ that way, which is the biblical way to see Him as the Savior, you can begin to see why the world hates Him. And why, as the Bible tells us in the book of John, the world loves darkness, and whenever He showed up as the light, they did not want anything to do with Him, and even tried to kill Him, because they despised Him. As a matter of fact, in the words of some of the Jews that are recorded in Scripture, they had the same attitude that many today have. Those Jews said in uh, John chapter 8, We are Abraham's children and have never been in bondage to any man. And Jesus said to them, Whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Jesus came, He said in John chapter 10, verse 10, that they might have life and that more abundantly. The world today is bent on forgetting about 
the specifics of Christmas. The first coming of Christ for sins. They change the definition of sin. They ignore the reality of the coming of the Savior into the world entirely. As I mentioned some time back, they had more readily believe in Santa Claus than they would the Savior. Before we close this morning, we need to touch on something else very vital. Christmas. Christmas. The true meaning of Christmas, the fact that the Savior came, the first advent of Christ, is a harbinger. One who proclaims the coming of something else. It's a harbinger of Christ's second coming. Of His second coming. He is coming again. Praise the Lord. The Bible tells us very specifically, I'll ask you to turn there, there are some 300 prophecies in the New Testament alone that pertain to the second coming of Christ. Certain individuals have told us that in the Old Testament, with regard to His first coming, there's approximately 300 different prophecies. In regard to His second coming in the Old Testament, there are also hundreds of prophecies concerning His second coming in the Old Testament. In those 39 books, there is in excess of 600 different prophecies speaking of Christ coming to the world. Both His first and second coming in 39 books. In the New Testament, in 27 books, there is approximately 300 prophecies speaking about the characteristics involved in His second coming. The Bible says much about the fact that Christ is coming again. Hebrews 9.28 Go there with me in your Bibles if you haven't yet. So Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many. There it is again. Having been offered once. That's a specific reference to His death on the cross. Having been offered once to bear the sins. That's a reference to the fact that He took on the sins. He was in the place of those For whom He died, God poured their sins, their iniquity, their transgression on Christ. Notice the next part of the phrase. Will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. Now that's an interesting statement. Notice it again. Will appear a second time without reference or second time for salvation without reference to sin. Whenever Christ comes again, that's another element of the salvation of His people. That He comes and receives them to Himself. That they are transformed into His glorious image. And that they will eventually be resurrected and conformed to His image. To those who, notice the text, eagerly await Him. If you're a Christian, the characteristic of your life is that you are looking for His second coming. You are waiting expectantly for it. Mindful of God's Word regarding the things 
that will transpire before his coming. As a matter of fact, we are living in a world today where we almost ought to be doing this. You know, looking at the watch, thinking it's any second now. It's any time. Because as we look around, and as we examine some of the things that the Bible has spoken of regarding the second coming of our Lord, it sure seems that the time is right. It seems as though that even in the technological advancements that we have made, that those are instrumental in bringing us closer to that time as we will all be able, the whole world, to behold Him. I was reading recently, we were at our home as we were reading through the book of Revelation of the two witnesses and how they will come and proclaim the message of Christ and eventually be killed by the Antichrist, and how he will lay their bodies in the streets of Jerusalem. And the world will be ex so excited about their death because they just couldn't have the fun and their sin that they wanted while those guys were alive, that they will send presents in recognition of their death as their bodies are there on the street. And then the Bible says, God will give them life and He will raise them up and the world will see it. How will they see it? How can the world today see an event in an obscure place all at the same time? Everyone in here knows the answer to that. Just jump on the laptop. and take a look at it. I don't know. I don't want to become prophetic. I'm not a prophet. I was recently working with some software that would allow uh, emergency responders to have immediate pictures in their uh, vehicles of the location that they will be going to. The moment they get the call, they will be able to see the place that is there. And I couldn't help but think of that event in Israel being live streamed to the world when those two are laid to rest there and get up after a few days. The time's right, and he is coming again. His second coming much different than his first. Look with me to Revelation 19. In the text down to verse 11. Revelation 19 and verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. 
And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet, who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And I can hear someone say, impossible. And I would simply say to you, the virgin will be with child. And she will give birth. And that was impossible. And God did it. And He came. And He came as the Savior. And as Hebrews 9 says, He's coming again, not in reference to sins. Why? Because He's already come in reference to sins insofar as the forgiveness of sins is concerned. He accomplished that. That's why He said on the cross just prior to His death, it is finished. He didn't mean the whole scheme of everything regarding His coming, first and second coming, together was finished. No. But the first one was with reference to His death for sin. Now, in closing, I'd like to read another text of Scripture. It's found in the book of Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. This comes from Paul's message that he preached on Mars Hill to the Romans. And I'll ask you to move down in the text with me to verse 30. And he says in verse 30, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. That was the message of Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 1. Repent, Jesus said, and believe the gospel. Repent from what? Repent from sin. And believe the gospel. Why? Well, take a look at the next verse. Paul said, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Christ died for sins. God raised him up, demonstrating the success of his death in bringing forgiveness and reconciliation to God, demonstrating the fact that God was well pleased with what he did, that God was satisfied. And the message today, Christ is coming again. He's coming again. He's coming the next time, though, is judged. And Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, describe the great white throne judgment. When Jesus takes his seat on the throne and judges the lost for their sin. The message of the cross of Christ today, the message of the babe in the manger, is a message of repent of your sins and believe the Savior. Because God has fixed a day when He will judge the sins of all people. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. What a praise and a blessing it is to know that God has already sent His Son that sin has been atoned for, and that on behalf of God's people. 
that He calls them now to believe in Him and to confess their sins. As a matter of fact, the Greek word for confess means to speak the same. It's a compound word made up of different words, and it's literally to say the same. What does that mean? Whenever we confess sin to God, we're calling sin, sin. We're calling it as God calls it. We're not saying those people are sinners and those people are sinners and I'm not as bad a sinner as others. We're saying, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness and reconciliation. I need the Savior. I need. Because my sins are against you. Not just that they've caused havoc in our lives and one day inevitably will result in the death of everyone, but that they are ultimately against God. And we need that forgiveness. Now those who have called on Christ know the joy of that forgiveness. The blessing of Mary as she recognized and proclaimed the glory of our Lord there in the book of Luke as Zacharias also recognized that they were sinners and, and they needed a Savior and He is here. What joy filled their heart. What joy fills our heart as we know now we have been forgiven. Those who are His people have been forgiven of their sins. Those who have believed in Him. And we are to consider the patience of our Lord, the delaying of His coming from our perspective, as salvation. And keep proclaiming the message that people are sinners. That they deserve God's judgment. And Christ has paid for sin. And those who will call upon Him will be saved. Let's pray. Thank You, Lord, for the message of Christmas that it acknowledges the fulfillment of the first advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. That He came as a babe. That He was and is God in the flesh. That He lived a life that is and was perfect without sin. And that He became sin for His people. That He was raised on the third day and that after speaking to those who had believed for 40 days, He ascended and took His place as your Son in heaven. And is there today as our great high priest. And thank you that He is coming again. And every eye will see Him. Bless us with the knowledge of these truths this Christmas. And as long as we are here, keep us watching and waiting for Him. In His name we pray. Amen.